everyone. Welcome to this educational program. Uh, strategic reglobalization, great power rivalry comes for the multilateral trading system. I am Patricia Vasconcelos, a board member of the Association of Foreign Correspondents in the U.S. and uh, U.S. and White House correspondent for uh, SBT Brazilian TV Network. Today we have a pleasure to receive and talk with us uh, with Dan Eikenson, Director of Policy Research at NDP Analytics. Dan, thank you so, so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure, Patricia. Uh, I'm happy to be with you all. And thank you also to uh, Thanos um, uh, Damaris of the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents for, for inviting me. Uh -huh. And uh, I would also like to thank the Heinrich Foundation for its sponsorship of the series and, and for publishing four of, uh, four of my papers over the past uh, year and another one's coming out uh, next month. So uh, happy about that. And I apologize to everybody who uh, I had to ask to postpone this <laughs> event last week until today because I was ill. But thank you for, for, for joining us again. We're happy to have you here with us. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to introduce you properly just before there, before that, an overview about our uh, educational program uh, today. So uh, during this program, Dan will unpack for us, foreign correspondents, all the critical points um, of his latest research, is strategic uh, reglobalization, great power rivalry comes for the multilateral trading system. Um, this educational program is developed in partnership with the Hearing uh, Foundation, Advancing Sustainable Global Trade. And um, the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents is solely responsible for the definition and the development of this program. Um, about Dan, he's an economist and renowned international trade expert who has spent over 30 years analyzing, communicating, and influencing the formulation of U.S. and global trade policy. Uh, Dan joined NDP Analytics after nine years as director of the Cato Institute Center for Trade Policy Studies, where he led a team of lawyers, economists, and political sciences uh, conducting research on all manner of trade policy. On subjects spanning from free trade agreements to international national investment treaties, trade laws to custom, cust customs procedures, uh, digital trade to the manufacturing economy. Dan has written dozens of policy papers. He has given congressional testimony. He has submitted statements and comments on proposed regulations to federal and state agencies. He appeared on national news programs um, and published scores of, of ads and articles in premium and media outlets. Prior to joining the Cato Institute in 2000, Dan was Director of International Trade Planning for an international trade consulting firm here in Washington, D.C. And from 1990 to 1997, Dan was a trade policy analyst at International Trade Law Practices. In addition to his many studies and articles, Dan is co-author of the book Anti-Dumping Exposed, the Devilish Details of Unfair Trade trade law. He earned an MA in economics from George Washington uh, University. So I know you have some um, um, some information to share with us, Dan, before we start. Um, if I can just pop up a question uh, here uh, for you. Um, you argue in your paper that the most favored nation and na national treatment, those concepts no longer exist, right? And uh, the, 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 the main rule of the trading system, which is a win-win exchange, does not happen anymore as it should be. Could you give us an example that could exemplify why this happened? Sure. Well, th th thanks. Thanks again, Patricia, for the for that introduction. I, I would say that the, um, th those, those, those precepts of the multilateral trading system of national treatment, most favored nation, mean non-discrimination, that trade policy should be uh, uh, pursued in a way that is uh, treats 
uh, investment and imports uh, from all countries the, the same way. I, I'm suggesting that we're entering an era where there is less incentive to, to uh, adhere to those, to those precepts and, and to those ideas. Uh, there's a lot of unilateralism going on. Uh, the United States, of course, most uh, famously or infamously imposed uh, tariffs on China in 2018 uh, by circumventing you know, the rules of the WTO uh, and, 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 um, and showing that it was more interested in being sort of a vigilante and, and defending its interests in a way that it sees most, most suitable to do so. Uh, and I think that that... Um, presents a big problem, but it also reflects, it presents a problem for the trading system, but it also reflects a sort of a change in the underlying conditions. The United States uh, was a big supporter uh, of the, the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, and the WTO. And one of the reasons it was is because it saw those, uh, it saw that institution as in US foreign policy interest. And I think that uh, that may no longer be the case. And, and that's why I'm, I'm concerned about uh, the future of the of the WTO, the trading system, uh, and that we're going to be turning toward um, 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 tr trading arrangements that are that show discrimination and favoritism toward uh, countries that uh, uh, that that are, that that ally, align with uh, U.S. interests or countries that align with Chinese interests will get favorable treatment uh, in trade, and those that don't will be discriminated against. So that. Um, that spells potential contraction uh, in, in, in the global economy and, and undermines the capacity of trade to, to help grow the economy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that our guests, they're going to have uh, many questions for you. We are going to open to those questions. If you could um, start your presentation and share all the, um, the, the slides you brought to us, um, we are happy to, to, to hear and learn from you. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate having the opportunity to have this, this conversation. Um, so before turning to, to the sort of the, uh, the theme of the paper, uh, let me just give you a little bit more of my, my background just to, so you get an idea of where I'm coming from. I, I was at the Cato Institute for over 20 years until um, March of, of 2021. And in my capacity there as, as director of the Trade Center and as a trade policy analyst, um, I was a big fan of the multilateral trading system. Uh, big supporter of it, a uh, big supporter of China's entry into the WTO and uh, an advocate of going, going easy on China as it was trying to implement the many, many reforms that it committed itself to over, over the years. I was a very big critic of U.S. government protectionism and unilateralism over the years. And I would, I'm sorry. No, no, uh, we are, we are, we are hearing. Okay, good. <laughs> um, but in my last couple of years at Cato, I began to appreciate the real challenge that China presents to both the United States and the trading system. Um, I began to understand that, 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 that free trade can't really be pursued in a vacuum without sufficient regard for national security, uh, but, but also that an increasing emphasis on national security uh, would subvert respect for the trade rules. So let, let me take about 20 minutes or so to reiterate some of the major points in the paper and maybe broaden the lens a bit to provide a little more context. Uh, and then since I'm speaking with uh, journalists and reporters uh, who tend to be more, more inquisitive than the average person, uh, we can get into a QA and a and get, get the conversation rolling for the, for the duration. So the, the, the major points of the paper, and let me just put up a slide here uh, uh, of, where do I share, uh, share a screen? Um, yeah. Share that. Um, yeah. So just here's the here's the the, the title of the paper, and it's uh, it's uh, strategic reglobalization. Great power uh, uh, power rivalry comes from the multilateral tr trading system. So the major points, as implied, there are that globalization is going through some changes. Uh, that geopolitical and national security considerations are driving those changes. Uh, and that the multilateral trading system uh, is 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 threatened by those changes. So let me let me get into that. Um, so you know a central premise underlying the case for free trade is that voluntary trade 
is, is not a zero sum game, but a positive sum game, a win, a win win sort of exchange that, that benefits all the parties involved. And reducing trade barriers uh, enlarges markets and, and increases the scope for, for specialization and, and economies of scale, which, which are essential to raising living standards around the world. So the economic benefits of trade exceed the economic costs of trade. So, so free trade is, is, an, is an economic net positive and, and, a, and a worthy objective. And I think that all remains true. But I would argue that it, it no longer suffices as a winning argument for free trade uh, amid all this hegemonic competition that exists today between the United States and China. I think the question of who benefits more or, or who suffers less from tariffs and other interventions become, becomes a relevant question, become relevant questions. Uh, today, interdependence is less likely to be regarded as a buffer against conflagration and more likely um, a source of, of, of anxiety uh, about over-reliance on unfriendly or undependable nations. Uh, so this has all been amplified by the pandemic and by supply chain disruptions following the pandemic, uh, by this battle for technological uh, supremacy between the United States and China, and these, these, these supply chains that start from critical minerals all the way up through finished products. So interdependence is, is seen more as a vulnerability to remedy and overcome. Uh, than something that's going to keep conflagration at, at, at bay. So uh, the, 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 today, I think the necessary analysis requires consideration of the strategic benefits and costs in addition uh, to the economic benefits and costs. And that, I think, creates a tension, uh, an existential uh, tension with the rules-based trading system because you know the world's largest economies are in a strategic competition where the winning tactics may all too often require measures that violate the trade rules and reduce trade level, levels. Uh, things like unilateral tariffs and production subsidies, export restrictions, investment restrictions, and so on. Meanwhile, there are other geopolitical pressures that are manifesting themselves now and that are likely to exacerbate this, 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 this nascent disregard for the trade rules. Things like war, uh, threats of new war, climate change, uh, public health crises and food shortages, you know, debt crises, capital flight, technological rivalry. These, these are considerations, I think, that are going to induce governments into um, um, favoring taking unilateral measures uh, in pursuit of strategic advantages. Um, so I think we should expect to see more governments pursue industrial policies that raise tariffs on certain imports, give subsidies to local firms, grant preferences to trade partners they favor and, and penalize those uh, whom they don't. <clears throat> so let's just go back to the, to the GATT system and, and the support for it, and, you know, you know the, the, the rationale behind it. Of course, it was founded in the wake of World War II uh, and uh, protectionism was seen as one of the contributing factors to, that, to the war and that economic opportunities and interdependence afforded um, by trade reduced the likelihood of, of future conflict. And GATT got, got off the ground in 1947 and, and more or less succeeded because it had very solid support from the United States. Uh, and, and it had support from the United States because U.S. Uh, officials saw it as consistent with U.S. foreign policy objectives. Um, the U.S. Was, was willing to accommodate what can be seen as asymmetric GATT terms, you know, um, uh, different, different prices of entry, different concessions made um, they were, the United States was willing to uh, absorb those asymmetries and accommodate them because um, they wanted to get as much buy-in as possible for the trading system because it would strengthen the West uh, against the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. Uh, at the time, the United States was by far the largest economy in the world. Uh, there was no real concern of an economic rival uh, emerging at that time um, under those circumstances. And of course, you know, you all know the story. Tar tariffs fell considerably. Trade blossomed in the second half of the 20th century. Um, it's partly due to trade liberalization, uh, partly due to political liberalization, technological breakthroughs like uh, containerization, uh, transportation, you know, uh, communications, revolutions in communications, the internet, et cetera, uh, that enabled um, uh, trade and investment to, to really blossom. And then we had you know, eight successful rounds of, of trade negotiations under the auspices of the GATT, culminating uh, at the, in the end of the Uruguay round in 1994 with the creation of the World Trade Organization in 1995. 
and the membership in, in GATT, which was 23 members in 1947, was 123 members in, in 1995 when the WTO was founded. Um, so the, then the Cold War ended and, and there was a sense of, you know, this prevailing Cold War triumphalism uh, in the West and, and in Washington, you know, the West had sort of won and prevailed in the Cold War. The Washington consensus, which uh, spoke of, uh, advocated for low taxes and, and uh, less restrictive regulations and free trade uh, was in vogue around the world. And I, I think the, that giddiness, um, you know, the end of history, uh, what helped pave the way for China's accession process into the WTO eventually exceeded in, in 2001. And the United States, <clears throat> there, you know, there were obviously geopolitical differences, differences about human rights and other things, but those, those issues were sort of sequestered from the commercial and economic potential. And, and uh, uh, we sort of focused on the upside of, of bringing China into this, this global economy. And in the United States, policy toward China was dictated by the, was, was a balancing act. You know, we had the the, the pro-trade business community, multinational community on one side advocating for engagement. And then you had import competing industries and labor unions on the other side, uh, you know, seeking protection and, and, and policy sort of split the difference. Um, and, you know, we had disputes, there were trade disputes and there were mechanisms to deal with them. Anti-dumping laws, countervailing duty laws, um, special safeguards, something called Section 421, which China agreed to allow sitting members of the, of the WTO to impose against China um, uh, for the first, uh, I forget how many years, 10 years or 15 years of China's membership in the WTO. There was a textile safeguard. We had strategic economic dialogues to sort of act as a lightning rod to absorb some of the tensions in the relationship. And that all seemed to work you know, reasonably well. Um, and then 2008 hit. Uh, and we had this, the, the, the financial crisis and the Great Recession. The U.S. economy was waylaid and, 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 and policymakers, opinion leaders were kind of shell-shocked. And they were wondering, you know, what happened here? Why are we uh, suffering through this big recession with high unemployment? Uh, we, the, our government has a lot of debt. A lot of that debt is held by China. Uh, China, their economy continues to grow at double digits. They're doing well. What, what did they do right and, and what did we do wrong? And there was a lot of hand-wringing and soul-searching, I think, in the United States. And that produced the calls for getting tougher on China, at the same time emulating, also calls to you know, emulate China's industrial policies. So there was this kind of post-2008 convergence of economic protectionists and national security hawks uh, started, started getting concerned uh, about China and its uh, plans for um, technological preeminence, um, its, uh, its um, um, indigenous innovation policies and things like that. So, so President Obama takes office in, in beginning of 2009 and he sort of responds to this. And he brings more cases against the WTO. Un under President Bush, his predecessor, we only filed a, a few cases against China. It was only in the last few years of, of Bush's eight year term terms. Um, but, but Obama brought a few more cases. There were a lot more anti-dumping countervailing duty cases. The first Section 421 special safeguard case on tires produced tariffs against China. And then there was a lot of the, the ball got rolling on revising export controls and investment um, review uh, reforms, things like that. So the rise of, of China changed U.S. perceptions, I think, uh, of the trading system. And uh, that it, it, you know, the trading system was conferring certain legitimacy upon China without compelling China to undertake the appropriate behavior, you know, act like a responsible stakeholder. Uh, and it was also a concern that it was too restricting of, uh, of the U.S., America's capacity to respond to China's burgeoning state capitalism. So, Trump enters the scene uh, in, in January 2017 after running a very protectionist anti-China election campaign. And the changes all seem very, very abrupt. Um, there had been this continuity of US policy going back 80 years to the R Franklin Roosevelt administration. 13 presidents of both parties generally supported trade, supported the, the GATT. They you know, indulged in protectionism every once in a while, but by and large, they saw trade as a, as a positive force. 
uh, and we're supportive of, of, of the system. Trump comes in and, and, and thinks protectionism is the tool to make America great again. And, you know, for the, for the first few years of, of the Trump administration, it, it, it did, it was shocking. And, and it did seem that uh, we were, this was just this aberration and that it was, we might snap back. But turns out that's not really the case. Uh, I think Biden is pretty indistinguishable from Trump in terms of his trade policies. Uh, he, you know, hasn't done anything about the, the tariffs on China, very little about the steel and aluminum tariffs that were imposed under national security guys. He uh, has no interest in pursuing trade um, promotion authority uh, and, and con contributing uh, meaningfully to, to any dialogue at the WTO. So trade policy has been subordinated in, in, in the Biden administration, like the Trump administration, subordinated to national security and geopolitical concerns. And I would say it didn't start with Trump. Trump just changed the tenor. It really started at the end of the Bush administration, uh, where the, uh, officials recognized that that we were going to have to uh, deal with the rising China and and that we may have to, uh, you know, uh, break out of this uh, our our restraints with respect to the the trade rules. O Obama, uh, more you know, more quietly than Trump, brought us in that direction. Trump brought us to the you know over the over the cliff, and and, and I think Biden is continuing uh, with those policies. And it's not the econ it's because we're not it's not the net economic benefits that we're concerned about anymore. It's the net strategic benefits. And by that I mean both the United States and China can suffer because of a policy. But if China suffers more in the from the perspective of the United States, that is that is a win. That's that's the new calculus. Uh, and since Biden hasn't done anything about the tariffs on China. I assume that the Biden administration thinks that in, in the long term, the, the relative benefit to the United States will, will, uh, will manifest itself. Uh, even though it's bad for US businesses and bad for US consumers, China will be hurt more. And, and I think that kind of thinking is gonna be uh, driving policymaking uh, in, in the near future. Um, if I can just show you a, a slide again here, let me, um, let me get, to that. Um, uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, let me uh, share the screen again. Sorry about that. Um, oh, here it is. So this is showing us um, as a share of, of, of global GDP uh, in three distinct periods here. And I just want to contrast uh, the period 1993 to 2007 to the, the post-2008 period. I mean, this doesn't look all that dramatic, but I mean, the 3.2% annual growth in trade as a share of GDP is much more significant than 1.2%. I mean, uh, this, this, this just reflects the openness and, and the globalization that was going on during that, that 15 year super period. And since 2008, we've been plateaued. I mean, 0.0%. I mean, it's, I think it's 0.04 or something like that growth. Um, so globalization is clearly changing and it's, it's flattened out. And it's, there are a lot of potential reasons for that. One of which is, I mean, we're still trading more uh, but the econ global economy is growing, uh, you know, it, it used to be the case that trade was growing faster than the global economy because there was so much, so many global supply chains. Here it's flattening out. One of the reasons might be because services are a much greater share of, of, of domestic economies now, uh, but they haven't kept pace in trade, but services are still not traded all that extensively. Uh, so we see the denominator growing, but not the numerator. Likewise, uh, China has, has uh, reallocated a lot of what used to be produced for export to its domestic market. So there's a, the production is still there, but it's not showing up in trade. The other thing is, you know, there's protectionism is is beginning to uh, uh, to to proliferate. So we're now in this flat era, and uh, this flat era is is what's inspiring um, new thoughts about trade policy and trade policy change. 
Um, let me uh, go back here. So um, national security has become a real sacred, uh, has always been a sacred, uh, you know, important, important role of government. I mean, the, you know, the first obligation of government is to protect its citizens. Um, Trump expanded the definition of national security to mean economic security, employment, uh, employment opportunities. Uh, there's been broad bipartisan support in the United States for ramping up export controls um, uh, and using them to kind of wage battle and to, um, to prevent China from making great strides uh, in, in the battle for technological preeminence. Um, investment restrictions uh, uh, have, have become much more rigid than, than they had been before. Um, the, and politically, the default is to err on the side of security. Uh, you know, trade versus security, people say, well, you know, security makes a lot more sense, you know, protect us. And, 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 and politically, it, 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 politically, you're more, a politician is more likely to be hurt uh, if he or she is seen as weak on, on, on national security uh, when trade is perceived, unfortunately, as an us versus them <laughs> endeavor. Uh, so uh, politicians basically don't get a lot of credit when they when they support free trade. Uh, they tend to get credit when they support protection because the protection seekers are are louder and they're and, and they're more noticeable. Um, but just uh, if I can take you back, and this is a bit clumsy of me, but let me see. Uh, is is that? Let me uh, let me share this one more time. Sorry. Um, uh, oh, this was sorry. This 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 slide was uh, um, the analog to the other one. This is this is investment. We saw investment uh, peak during that that the the, the pro globalization era, and then dr dropped dramatically since two thousand eight. So that's just to to reinforce the previous one. But let me get, let's get to the next one. So this is uh, in, in the United States, percent of people in the United States who have an unfavorable view of China. And, you know, it's gone up and down over the years. It's expanded dramatically since Trump, uh, but then again, since the pandemic, you know, to 2020. Uh, and so with numbers like this, uh, th it reinforces for politicians that they should have a, a sort of strident or, you know, cautious uh, approach toward toward China. So I, I, I don't think it's uh, likely that that, that, that policy is going to change any any time soon. Um, let me go back to uh, there. Okay. So um, just a few more points and then I'll then I'll wrap up. Um, so the uh, when non discriminatory non discriminatory trade rules break down as they are uh, breaking down um, with you know the, the the WTO sort of laying fallow and 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 have it being disabled at the, uh, uh, at, the at the adjudicative level, uh, no new um, negotiations really bearing any fruit. You there is there is a greater importance of allies. Uh, if if you're not going to have non-discriminatory trade and you're going to look for pre preferential kinds of trade arrangements. Uh, then you need to woo allies, and there's a very major importance for soft power. And of course, China has, for the past decade or so, been pursuing this uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, providing investment to uh, to countries and developing countries in particular, but but some some developed countries as well. Um, the U.S. has this this Build Back Better, uh, uh, nascent Build Back Better program under under Biden, uh, preferential trade agreements. Um, I think. Trump was was pretty tone deaf with respect to the need for allies. He was very assertive that you know America first, uh, uh, you owe us. Um, you know he 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 hit our allies. He hit American allies with steel and aluminum tariffs, and then expected them to be on board with U.S. sanctions against China. Uh, Biden is similarly tone deaf, it seems, um, but I mean maybe more strategic. His policies are not America first, though they're worker centric. But they're, it's just the rhetoric that's different. It's I mean they're 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 essentially the same uh, thing. He's got this Indo-Pacific Economic Forum that he's uh, been touting, 
which promises virtually you know, no new market access to the United States, but you know, sort of requires commitments from signatories to buy into US labor and environmental standards and digital standards and uh, supply chain resilience uh, um, uh, approach, tax policy, anti-corruption. And, and so the conclusion I draw from that is the, the, in, the Indo-Pacific is a way of saying, oh, we're not giving you anything new, but if you don't go along, we're gonna take things away. You're, you're, you're not gonna have this preferential access to the US market. Not, and I, I have the feeling that this is the direction that we're headed. So before we get there, I would say, let's, let's, let's be sure of one thing. There's, we seem overconfident uh, that the, the, the American politicians seem overconfident that the world is going to um, get, on, 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 get in bed with the United States on this. And, and let me just show you one last slide and then I'll, uh, then I'll stop here. Uh, this is also in the paper, but it's, it's from uh, Pew Research. And this just shows uh, the percentage who say it, it's more important uh, to have economic ties with the US than China. And Canada, of course, it's on America's northern border, 87% of Canadians. This, is, this, this was done this year. Um, ironically, or not ironically, um, oddly at least, Mexico, only 50%, uh, that's also on the US border. But my point is, is that there are, there are lots of countries that uh, see a, a major cost to um, you know, to favoring the United States over China, or to doing something that pleases Washington and upsets Beijing. Um, so these are the kinds of considerations I think that are going to animate uh, and amplify trade policy going forward. There is this strategic uh, reglobalization that's going on. I do think that the, the trading system uh, is is imperiled. Um, you know, it's it. Uh, you know, it it's been that they haven't really. There, there, there have been no real successful trade negotiations there since its outset. Um, we have countries with disparate, disparate uh, approaches and different uh, economic issues to deal with. Um, and I, but I think most importantly, it's that the United States no longer sees it as costless uh, to to to. Uh, to, 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 be, to be a part of that system. I, I think the United States sees itself as being restrained by that system and that it's too enabling of rivals, uh, specifically China. So why don't I stop there and uh, we can have a conversation. I've gone on probably a little, a little too long, but I'll, I'll stop and thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. I would like to invite our uh, guests, everybody who is uh, watching us to feel uh, free to drop some questions here um, in our um, message here uh, at the box so I can I can forward uh, the all the questions to to Dan. I would I would like to follow up uh, taking in account this last uh, graphic that you shared uh, with us um, um, saying this um, the graphic that shows who say it's more important to keep relations with the US rather than than China right yes. Uh, uh -huh. And you, you, as you showed to us, Canada, eighty-seven uh, percent, and we see two Latin, two Latin America countries, which is Mexico and Brazil. Mexico, fifty percent, and Brazil, forty-nine percent. And we don't see any other uh, Latin America country uh, here. From your perspective, what does it show that? Um, Latin America in general uh, believes that it's 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 okay to um, um, to put Ch China first rather than the U.S. What is lacking in between those countries and United States from from your perspective? You, you know, um, th this chart is misleading in the sense that it's just a sub sample. I I, I think this is G twenty countries uh, or G twenty five or something. Um, so what you see here is you, you, um, you see a diversity uh, of opinion. You see you know, countries that are closer to China uh, uh, 
tend tend to tend to have a have a lower number here. I think developing countries in general, if we had a if we had a, a, a bigger uh, sample size, would see you know numbers closer to Nigeria's um, because China is a huge investor in Africa and parts of of Asia, and and I, there's recognition that having those economic ties is important. Part of this reflects, I think, also a lack of trust that the United States uh, will be there in the long run. If, if, no, many of these governments have, have expressed concern about having to make a choice and nobody wants to make a choice between the United States and China. They, every government wants to be able to have you know, access to the best of, of, bo of both worlds. Uh, and, but uh, I think some, for some countries, the concern is, you know, the, the United States has elections every two years, every four years. The next president might be more isolationist and, and less interested in, in, uh, in soft power and in, in cultivating relationships. Um, so that the safe bet would say, well, let's, you know, stay on the good side of Beijing. Um, I, I, I also think that there's also the, the opportunity for a lot of savvy third countries uh, to, 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 to get the best of both worlds, to play Washington and Beijing off against each other. Um, but it, 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 it depends on, on how this all unfolds uh, go, going forward. Uh, there was discussion about, uh, you know, maybe the US and China uh, can limit their rivalry to just the technology sector and, and put, um, you know, sort of cordon off that area and then continue to have a, a meaningful and engaging trade relationship elsewhere. But it just doesn't seem possible to me if, if, if two governments are trying or are in a race or think perceive themselves as being in a, in a race for technological supremacy and that the tools to use in that race in, uh, include hamstringing the opponent, uh, uh, you know, making it harder for the other to, to progress. It, it's just hard to see how you can have a, a lot of goodwill coming out in other areas. It, it's going to be, in, it's going to be uh, more consistent with policy to, to undermine, you know, wherever possible. So, so I do see this sort of cold war I, I know a lot of uh, my, my former colleagues, a lot of people in the Washington pro-trade community hate to use the term Cold War, but it's it's pretty evident to me for the past few years that, that is, that's the direction that we're headed. It's not like there's a nuclear arms race, but a battle to win the hearts and minds of other countries. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, the advantage was to Beijing uh, during the Trump years because because Trump was just so insulting and, uh, and, and he treated uh, uh, our allies with such contempt. But then COVID happened and it seemed like there was a cover up and then, um, then Hong Kong and, and uh, Shenzhen and Taiwan and, and then the, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, which has not been uh, denounced by, uh, by Beijing has, has made, I think China has squandered the opportunity to to win hearts and minds uh, at that point. Great. So thank uh, as you already mentioned, right, uh, the, the COVID and the invasion of Ukraine. Um, in your paper, you, you give, as you explain here uh, to us, you gave an important historical background explaining that the rules-based trading system rose from the ashes of two world wars and the Great Depression. And now the world uh, leaves uh, um, those two moments, right? A post-pandemic moment and the war uh, in Ukraine. Um, can those two factors, as you just mentioned, COVID and the war in Ukraine, create a new model of world um, trade system? Or this, this is already happening and uh, we just didn't realize or put some, I don't know, definition and new rules? And how do you see this? Yeah, no, I, I think COVID uh, was a catalyst for, um, or, it, 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 or it was a catalyst in some cases or an amplifier, an accelerant in other cases to 
this whole uh, movement of supply chain resilience and uh, this this recognition or this assertion that uh, that we're more vulnerable the more um, uh, dispersed our, our supply chains are, the more parties upon whom a country is reliant to get critical, you know, um, uh, healthcare products or technology products or automobiles or batteries, uh, the more vulnerable they are. And therefore, we should encourage a repatriation of supply chains. We should give incentives to build domestic, you know, semiconductor plants. Uh, we should um, change trade rules to uh, to require, you know, a higher percentage of a of a, of a product's componentry to be manufactured in, say, North America. Um, my my view is that the, the answer to this kind of vulnerability, supply chain vulnerability, is diversification, and diversification doesn't mean repatriation. Doesn't mean producing everything at home. Does it mean friend shoring? Well, it seems that's, you know, friend shoring is what the Biden administration seems to be advocating, but I, I don't really see a whole lot of it happening just yet. Um, meaning have your supply chains run through countries that are uh, allied uh, uh, with you. Uh, so anyway, I, I think COVID uh, and just supply chain vulnerabilities um, because of disruptions from the war uh, in Ukraine, as well as what the war in Ukraine has has revealed about um, about the world, that even if there were a plurality of countries, even if there if there were consensus that hey the World Trade Organization is a good thing and we should put our efforts back into multilateralism and make this work, we see from those countries that have uh, endorsed sanctions, those people who those countries that have um, supported Ukraine versus those who have remained neutral suggests that there is a, a, a very wide range uh, of opinions out there. And we can't um, assume that we have comity, that we have a, 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 you know, a commonality uh, a, a of interests. So um, th these are momentous issues, uh, I mean, COVID and, and the war and, and it raises, you know, um, um, uh, levels of insecurity, and, and and induces governments into looking for, you know, next best alternatives. And you know, war war is is, is extremely disruptive. And uh, when you impose sanctions or limit trade with countries, you reduce the scope for trade, which means you reduce the scope for economic growth. I mean, we we. We trade so that we can specialize and we, we specialize because we want to produce more and we want to produce more so we can consume more. And when you get rid of trade barriers and you have a larger market, you, that all uh, takes off and grows you know, geometrically. Same thing happens in reverse. You close markets and you say this world is in the China sphere and this part of the world is in the US sphere. Uh, the, the global economy is gonna be smaller. Um, it may be more secure, and I do think um, one way to capture what we're looking at going forward is governments are not going to be looking for the most economically optimal supply chain, but the most secure uh, supply chain. And so the, the best supply chain is not necessarily the most economically optimal. It has to be strategically optimal. It has to be strategic optimal, okay? And as you mentioned, the, the, the sanctions, um, do you do you believe uh, we we had an interview uh, here um, also for the foreign um, um, press correspondent association of um, an interview we uh, that she argues that the golden days of the sanctions are over. And um, do, do you agree with this with this concept that the effects uh, of the sanctions, uh, then we are talking against Russia, but that impacts uh, the whole world, that those effects uh, that are can be felt now and uh, it won't it won't work um, in a long term. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, 
sanctions in general are an, an expendable resource. And uh, the United States has turned to sanctions quite a lot uh, over the past couple of decades, uh, particularly over the past few years. And you know, for sanctions to work, they need to be multilateralized. Uh, all of the major economies need to be on board, uh, meaning you know, all the major buyers or all the major producers of a particular commodity that is being um, uh, embargoed or boycotted. Um, the, I mean, I, I, sanctions as a tool of warfare in lieu of you know, sending people out onto the battlefield, I, I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a decent trade-off. I, I, I prefer that. Uh, but I think if you continue to push for sanctions, some governments just can't continue to, 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 to stand shoulder to shoulder because their economies are smaller and they, they can't endure it. Uh, it. It incentivizes countries like Russia or Iran or China to look for other ways around the US dominant uh, financial system, the dollar clearing system um, for other forms of currency, other ways to clear markets. It gives rise to black markets. Uh, it creates um, friendships among uh, countries that are, I don't wanna say enemies, but countries that uh, we are, uh, have issues with. And so, there are, there are costs, there are downsides. So we shouldn't be so um, cavalier in our use of, 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 uh, uh, of sanctions. And we need to recognize that if they're going to work, they, they can't be unilateral, they have to be multilateral uh, and uh, they, should be, um, you know, they should be used in, 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 in rare circumstances, not as an everyday tool. Mm -hmm. Now, a question here um, on China. Uh, you argue that um, US tariffs on imports from China originally imposed in 2018 uh, remain in place today despite economic costs to, you, to US business uh, and consumers. And this might be because the Biden administration must believe that China will suffer more over the medium to long term through loss of export market share, disinvestment, supply chain relocation, and other adjustments that carry economic, social, and strategic costs. Is this going to work, in your opinion, in favor of the US interest? Well, um, I think a lot of things have to happen. Uh, we, what business, what, what business does not like is uncertainty. And right now there's a lot of uncertainty in the global economy and, and you know, because of COVID, because of war, uh, because of um, changing geopolitical factors, um, we um, need to see how, how things play out. We, we are seeing companies saying that they're leaving China, that they're moving to Vietnam or to India. We are seeing some disinvestment. There's still quite a lot of trade between China and the rest of the world. Um, but at some point, um, I, I think what will have a bigger impact is, is not the tariffs, but it's the, it's the export controls and the investment restrictions that are impeding China's access to semiconductor technology. Um, and, you know, this issue is highly debated in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, a lot of trade folks will say, you know, we, when we willy nilly impose export controls on products, uh, we are depriving, uh, like on, on chips and chip manufacturing equipment, we are depriving US producers of revenues, which they need. They need those, re those revenues to, to feed into their, um, R&D expenditures to create the next generation of, of semiconductors, et cetera. Uh, and by imposing these kinds of sanctions on China, we are hastening their pursuit of self-sufficiency in this area. Now, the problem I have with that argument is that China has been pursuing self-sufficiency for a couple of decades now and very explicitly you know, over the past uh, several years. So. To me, that's not a cost of the U.S. export control actions. That that's already happening, but I do think what we need is a way to evaluate 
the benefits and the costs of export controls. Most people don't know. I, I'm saying that we need to have a, the, the new optimization is not whether the net economic benefits of trade are, uh, are positive, it's the net strategic benefits, but we don't really have a, a, a sound way of measuring those costs and benefits. So, uh, you know, right now the Bureau of Industry and, um, uh, and Security at the Commerce Department, which administers our export controls, doesn't have a, a real sound way of knowing that they know that, hey, we're depriving China of this technology. And if this, these sanctions are multilateralized, chances are 80% that it'll be effective or only 20% that it'll be porous. But we don't know at what cost. We don't know how much the deprivation of revenues to US companies is hurting their investment going forward. So I think we, my next paper for Heinrich is uh, on something called domestic transparency, which is a, it's about protectionism and, and how to um, shed light on, on, on trade policies at home that will um, uh, uh, motivate people to, to recognize the costs of, of protection and speak out against it. Right now, you only have those seeking protection or seeking sanctions that, are, that have the ears of policymakers. So part of that uh, domestic transparency would be to include a, a ways to estimate the benefits, the strategic benefits and costs of export controls, investment um, 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 review restrictions, et cetera. Um, but, 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 I, but I don't know, uh, you know the, the, the tariffs seem, um, uh, you know, they, have, they have imposed a lot of costs on downstream US companies that rely on imported Chinese uh, industrial inputs and raw materials. Uh, they have contributed to a, 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 a rise in the cost of living. It's inflationary. So it is problematic. Um, but what is the end game? I mean, is, 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 the, is the objective to get China to abandon its uh, state capitalist model, uh, to return back toward its pro-market uh, orientation that it had been pursuing up through the early 2000s? Uh, it's it's unclear what, what the ultimate objective is. It seems to me now we're locked into this, uh, this, this tech, technology race that is going to be sort of all consuming. Um, and uh, we just need to figure out a way to just to continue to do that while you know, enjoying peaceful uh, and prosperous commercial relations with, with the rest of the world. Uh -huh. And uh, the population, they have an opinion that leads to the, the next question, um, which is about the graphic that you shared with us that shows that 82%, uh, if we are not wrong, uh, of those heard for the pool that they have unfavorable views of China starting in 2018, it looks like. The question is what happened uh, starting in that point that the, the number of people that are unfavorable, unfavorable to China increased dramatically, in your opinion? What happened in order to have such an amount, uh, number of Americans uh, thinking like that? You know, uh, there's this sort of feedback loop. Um, I, I would say, Official Washington started to um, have its doubts about China on a bipartisan basis, um, you know, toward the end of the Obama administration. Uh, there was this emerging consensus that uh, China had uh, intentions to, you know, continue to borrow Western technology, force technology transfer, subsidize, um, you know, domestic pursuit of uh, technological patents uh, in a way that produces externalities uh, for the rest of the world. Um, what, what happened in 2020, of course, was COVID emerged. And the, part of the narrative in the United States was that, uh, that that COVID came from a, a Chinese lab uh, and that the Chinese government was not being cooperative with the rest of the world and trying to get to the bottom of the origins of COVID. And in fact, that they were, they had, may have had something to hide. And 
then of course there were there, uh, there were Beijing's foreign policy maneuvers, uh, their crackdown in Hong Kong, uh, sort of their bellicose rhetoric toward, uh, toward, toward Taiwan, the human rights issues in Shenzhen, um, lots of the, the, the Chinese government and Xi Jinping in particular was, was portrayed as sort of a return to, um, to Maoist sort of dictatorship. And not that, you know, most Amer every American or, or even most Americans, you know, understand that, uh, what, you know, the meaning of all that. Uh, but uh, it's here in the news that the news likes to present issues in an us versus them sort of context. Trade certainly lends itself to that. Um, you know, when we talk about trade, the, the, the one thing that the media picks up on every month is the trade deficit. You know, the Americans routinely import more than they, they export. And that is perceived as a, a sign that we're losing a trade because exports are our team's points, imports are uh, the other team's points. The trade account is the scoreboard. We have a deficit, so that means we're losing a trade. And the only way we could be losing a trade is if the other team is cheating. And uh, the fact is trade deficit is not a sign of whether we're winning or losing at, at, at uh, trade. Uh, when we have it run a trade deficit, that means we're running a capital account surplus. That's because foreigners demand much more uh, US assets than Americans demand of foreign assets. So the dollars come back in the United States that way. So anyway, the, my, my point is there's an a tendency to oversimplify trade as this competition between us and them. Uh, and so with growing trade deficit, with all the rhetoric, the trade war, COVID, the foreign policy um, issues, uh, China's bad reputation metastasized. Um, so two more questions before we wrap up. Uh, one in na about national security. Um, in your paper, you write that um, the Trump's Commerce Department, you remember that they uh, that administration blacklisted certain Chinese technology companies and broadened the scope of technology exports to be restricted, and the Biden administration added to both lists. Uh, how those actions regarding uh, to protect national security impact the global trade in between those two countries? Uh, yeah, that has a pretty significant impact. Um, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm still uh, deliberating about the meaning of this. I, I, I've come to the point where I, where I see value in being very diligent about Chinese investment in US technology, about exporting certain products uh, to Chinese technology companies. Um, but I, you know, this, this all began 10, 15 years ago when the United States um, start, had, had the company Huawei in its crosshairs. Uh, and started identifying Huawei as a national security threat because of its ownership structure and its ties to the People's Liberation Army. There were all sorts of hearings in Washington and rarely was anything of uh, importance or substance shared with the public. It was all sort of classified. And for, for, uh, for many years, I, I, I wrote that I thought that this was an effort to hold back Huawei, which had made uh, great strides forward as a leader in uh, in, uh, in in internet communications uh, gear, and and that the U.S. wanted to catch up and build a champion to catch up with them, and the United States was going around the world advising other governments to rid their their networks of Huawei gear, and I, I thought this was a a commercial objective. Uh, masquerading as a national security one, but I'm not. not I'm not quite as sure now. Now I'm uh, maybe it's because I'm getting older and I'm a little bit more um, um, uh, conservative. Uh, we that it's better to be safe. Um, but uh, I, and so I think we we, sh we we there are costs. I don't know what they are. Costs of these kinds of national security uh, impediments to trade. We need to do our best to figure out what the costs and benefits are. Uh, and while recognizing that there are threats, 
we need to have a system in place that has oversight over the BIS, you know, the Commerce Department's uh, uh, Bureau of uh, Industry and Security and others, uh, because otherwise it's, it's very easy for them to say, oh, it's a national security issue, we're imposing restrictions. It's a national security issue, we're uh, you know, banning this investment. So uh, we need to make sure that it's uh, precise, that it's well-targeted, and that, that these kinds of sanctions and export controls are multilateralized so that we're not just depriving US companies of export opportunities and, and, and giving them to the, the Germans or the Koreans or the Japanese. Okay, and the last question, which it looks very broadly, I'm not sure if there is a specific answer, but if you can help us with that, a project, a projection um, on your opinion, what will become of the World Trade Organization, the future <laughs> of the WTO with all that was uh, that was being said here? Yeah, <laughs> well, look, I... I, I the, the WTO is this uh, uh, clearinghouse of resources. I mean, there are a lot of people who are heavily vested in the WTO, a lot of smart economists and lawyers and academics who publish the research there. Uh, it is a, is a great place for governments to convene, to discuss trade issues, climate issues that, that they're moving into now, gender issues, things that, are, in my opinion, are deviate from the original mandate of the GATT and the WTO. Um, in that system requires consensus on changes, requires consensus on, 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 on new trade uh, agreements, um, which I think is going to be elusive. And, and I don't think this, the, the, the WTO has the support of the United States or, or really of China. Uh, push comes to shove, China would not be supportive of some of the things that, some of the reforms that would be necessary that the United States would demand uh, to keep it going forward. But I, I think the WTO can and should exist as an organization for having conversations and producing research uh, and, and hearing um, international perspectives. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, it has a future right now as a venue for, uh, um, for, for new trade agreements for deciding, uh, adjudicating disputes. You know, under the original GATT system before the WTO, there was a dispute system, uh, mechanism, but nobody was required to do anything. Um, you could block the decision. So if, if the GATT ruled against the United States, you know, we think the United States is violating, you know, article one, two, three of this or that agreement and recommend that the United States comes into conformity, the United States could just blow it off. Uh, and 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 not worry about it. Under the WTO, there's 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 more compulsion to 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 uh, oblige the findings of the of dispute. So, I think maybe there should just be recommendations or guidances, uh, and that will force governments to to hammer it out. The reason we have so so much has been laid on the lap of the WTO dispute settlement system is because the trade negotiators over the years never hashed, they didn't hash enough out. They left too much um, vague uh, to be interpreted by the dispute settlement system. And the better way to do that is to have that decided at the government to government level. And so I think it's possible, but I don't think the WTO was ever going to return to the form that it had uh, up through the early 2000s. Well, thank you very much, Dan Eikenson, for unpacking for us, foreign correspondents, all the critical points of your latest the research. So I'm here talking in, on behalf of all, all foreign journalists who, who are here with us uh, today. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure, Patricia. I, I really appreciate the time. And uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me, uh, you, you can find me at ndpanalytics.com, Dan Eikenson at ndpanalytics.com. We can put your contact um, after in our uh, website. This video will be available soon in yeah, our... Yeah.
in our website. I spoke today in this educational program with Anne Eikenson, Director of Policy Research at NDP Analytics. And this educational program is developed in partnership with Henrich Foundation. Thank you all of you who are here with us, uh, sharing um, with us all of this content. Thank you very much. Have you all a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.